All right, today we have a projectile that, while traveling horizontally, strikes and sticks to the end of a rod that's hanging at rest from a pin. And we're going to solve for the angular velocity of the rod and the ball immediately after the collision, as well as how far this rod swings upward after the collision. Now, you might have seen a similar problem in which a ball strikes the end of a simple pendulum that's just a block hanging from a string. And the problem is solved using the conservation of linear momentum. But because this problem we're tackling today is a rod connected to a pivot and not a simple pendulum, the conservation of linear momentum doesn't apply here. Instead, we'll have to turn to something called the conservation of angular momentum. So if we let this dart collide with a simple pendulum, when these two objects collide, there's no outside forces acting horizontally on either of the objects. It's just one object pushing sideways on the other. So in the absence of an outside force, linear momentum is conserved. Now it's true, there is this string and gravity acting on the block. But during the collision, they're not only canceling out, but they're only acting vertically on the system. So they won't affect the horizontal momentum of the system, that is the dart and the block. But because today we're dealing with a rod hanging from a pin, there's a tiny but critical difference. So if we remove this pin and allow the rod to just float in space, when the ball collides with the rod, they'll move together to the right. It's this pin that keeps the end of the rod from moving horizontally, meaning the pin acting horizontally exerts an outside force in this collision, which means linear momentum isn't conserved. But using angular momentum, we can get around the outside forces by this pin. See, the key in this problem is that just like an outside force causes a change in linear momentum, or what we'd call an impulse, an outside torque causes a change in angular momentum, or what we'd call a twirl. So if we can find a point in this apparatus that doesn't have any torque around it, then angular momentum will be conserved around that point. And that brings us to the importance of the pin here. You see, the pin's going to be acting vertically to hold up the rod, and when the ball strikes the rod, it's going to be acting horizontally on the tip of the rod here. But if we look at all of these forces that are acting on the pin, they don't produce any torque around the pin right here. That's because a torque is the result of a force acting at a radius. And these forces on the pin are all acting directly on the pin. They have a radius of zero. Therefore, any force by this pin on the rod is in fact not going to produce a torque on the rod around this point. And that might seem strange compared to a linear collision where linear momentum is conserved regardless of what point we're looking around. But that's the trick in this problem. We can apply the conservation of angular momentum, but only to this point right here at the pin. But applying angular momentum to this situation, we can say the initial angular momentum we're using L for angular momentum, is going to equal the final angular momentum. Now, angular momentum can be calculated as I omega, or the inertia of an object times its angular velocity, for a rotating object, or MVR for a translating object. That is an object's mass times its velocity times however far it is from some point around which we're trying to measure angular momentum. And I'll link a video down in the description explaining just how something moving in a straight line can have angular momentum, because that seems admittedly a bit weird. So going back to the angular momentum around this pin, before the collision, we just have this ball moving along in a straight line. So we can say it's going to have some angular momentum, m its mass, times v its velocity, times r, that is the distance when it strikes the rod from the pin, to where it hits the tip of the rod. That's going to be the length of our rod in this case. And we're going to set that equal to the angular momentum of everything after the collision. Now, after the collision, both this ball and this rod are going to be rotating backwards. So we're going to look at the angular momentum after the collision, not as though it's this translational motion, but rather as rotational motion. That is to say, we're going to look at the angular momentum as the total inertia after the collision times the angular velocity. Now, the total inertia of this entire apparatus after the collision is actually going to be the inertia of the rod plus the inertia of the ball. Now, the inertia of a rod rotated around its end can be expressed as one-third its mass times its length squared. And the inertia of our ball, which is really just a point mass revolving around this point, is going to be its mass times its radius. Again, that is the distance from the pivot to the ball.
And that leaves us with this expression that we can use to solve for the final angular velocity. All we need to do is just sub in the different values from in this problem. So we've got the mass of the ball is 1. It's traveling along at 10 meters per second, so we put those values in. And it's going to strike the end of the rod, so that's at a radius of 2. And plugging in the values for our rod, as well as the point mass in the inertia terms, we find there's a total angular momentum before the collision of 20, and that's equal to 8, that's the total inertia of our entire apparatus, times omega final. And we find the final angular velocity of this entire system immediately after the collision is 2.5 radians per second. Now, going back to this simple pendulum, after the collision, the dart and the block would swing upward converting kinetic energy into potential until they reached their maximum height. And with the exception of this being a rod rather than a ball and string, the angle to which this rod swings upward is really no different. But because this is a solid rod rather than a simple pendulum over here, our solution is going to get a bit more complicated. See, with a simple pendulum, all the mass moves upward the same distance. But over here, the ball and the tip of the rod will travel upward farther than other points along the rod. So what we need to do is look at the center of mass of this entire rod and ball assembly. And really, we need to look at how far that center of mass will move upward. Now, the center of mass of any assembly of objects within some axis is given by this equation. And all we're going to do is find the center of mass of this assembly, I'll say relative to the pin right here, which we're going to say has a position of zero. So starting with the rod itself, we know the rod has a mass of three and a length of two. Well, in truth though, because this rod has a distribution of mass, the center of mass of the rod on its own is at a position of one. So over in our center of mass equation, I'm going to plug in three for the mass of the rod, and 1, the position of center of mass of our rod. And next we have the ball, which has a mass of 1 kilogram, and it's at a distance of 2 meters beneath our pivot, or what we're saying is the origin here. Plugging in our masses in the denominator, we'll find that the center of mass of this entire system sits 1.25 meters beneath the pivot point. And the importance of finding the center of mass in this system is because once we've gone through and figured out where the center of mass is located, we can apply the conservation of energy to this entire system, allowing kinetic energy to turn into potential as the rod swings upward. And the whole idea here is that on average, our center of mass is going to move up a certain distance, gaining potential. So going back to the conservation of energy, we're just going to have kinetic turns into potential. Now the kinetic energy of this entire assembly is going to be given not by 1 half mv squared, which you might be used to seeing for kinetic energy, instead we're going to look at it as rotational kinetic energy, because this entire assembly is rotating around this point. So we're going to say the kinetic energy is 1 half i omega squared, and as this rod swings upward, that mass is going to gain some height, so ultimately it will gain some potential, mgh. Now, subbing in our numbers, we've got 1 half times the inertia, and we actually already worked that out. The inertia of this entire assembly is 8, multiplied by the final angular velocity, which isn't the end of the problem. It's really just the angular velocity immediately after this collision. Remember, that was 2.5 radians per second. We're going to set that equal to the total mass, because we really have 4 kilograms moving upward here. That's th 3 from the rod and 1 from the ball, times 9.8 times h. And working this out, we find the increase in height of the center of mass of the rod is 0.6377 meters. Now, this is an increase in height. It's not an angle that we're trying to solve for. But if we look at this as a big right triangle here, we know the center of mass initially was sitting 1.25 meters beneath the pivot point. And when it swings backward, it's going to have gained some height of 0.6377 meters. Well, realize that center of mass is still 1.25 meters away from our pin. And what we find in here is a right triangle. And the key in the whole thing is looking at this side of that right triangle. You see, we can express this side of that right triangle, or the adjacent side relative to this angle, as 1.25, that's the hypotenuse, times the cosine of this angle.
We can also say this distance, the total distance from the pin to the center of mass, that's 1.25 meters, minus the 0.63 meters that the center of mass moves upward. And if you work this out for the angle, we'll find that this rod and ball swing backward 61 degrees. So I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.